working. All right, cool. All right, guys, welcome back. Thank you so much for tuning in once again. This is our second episode of The Real Talk. Not The Real Talk. This is our second episode of Real Talk. And uh, last week, we discussed uh, essentially what is part one of our company values. And so what we realized is that this is really a two-part thing, and just in values in general. So last week, we talked about authenticity. If you didn't get a chance to check out that episode, highly recommend it, uh, partially because a lot of what we uh, realized and discovered inside of the podcast, inside of the, the conversation, was that uh, authenticity, especially in regards to values, is something that we cannot figure out on our own. So the call that we made last week was hopefully that you can jump in, either in the comments down below or inside of our Discord group, and join in a conversation because we are a relatively small group right now. And we've explored in depth and at length all of these different aspects of authenticity. But if we're trying to understand and explore authenticity on a large global level, well, we need to have a large global conversation. Oh, you think darkness is your ally? This is an Is this real life? Is this real? Welcome. Welcome to the real life. I need to know. What is real? How do you define real? Hi, Hoso. Bienvenido. Accueillir. You merely adopted the dark. Welcome to Real Talk. Real Talk. I was born in it. With Shadow Walker. Part of the exploration of this project in general is just figuring out all of these different methods to do the best job of communicating these conversations that we have. So what you'll see, you'll notice we're going to play with a few things. Uh, Ali and I were just talking about how it's very much a prototyping type experience. So you'll notice uh, this is not perfectly figured out and we don't want it to be. We want to be discovering and exploring and learning about this as we go. So you can see kind of what the process is. Ali's got a lot of experience when it comes to tech and visuals. So we've got a great place to start from, but this is a whole new project and we're trying to explore it in a whole new way. So authenticity for us right now, it looks like, well, right now we're in San Jose. We set up things in a different way. We're going to play with different formats, try stuff out, discover. So for, especially here at the beginning, you'll notice we're going to try a bunch of stuff. And over time, we'll end up settling into more of a routine and you'll be able to understand, you'll be able to know what you're getting into and know what to expect. But uh, for a minute here, there'll be different stuff like this. Uh, but today is part two of our values. And so as I mentioned on our last episode, real is built on top of two pillars of values, one being authenticity, the second one being right livelihood. And so that's going to be the basis of what we're talking about today. We're going to speak a little bit more to it. And uh, in addition to that, and part of the reason why I love this two-part sort of open-ended topic around values is that not only do we have the company values that are very important, but each one of us as individuals and you know, each one of you as individuals have our own internal values. And so in addition to talking about right, right livelihood, I also want to talk about the core value that is uh, very centered to my being, which is integrity. And so those are sort of the two, the various different things in the topic that we're going to talk about. So let's jump into uh, right livelihood because real is the topic of the podcast and also the container of which all this is happening. So right livelihood and why is it an important value for real? Right livelihood is something that I was fortunate enough to be exposed to by Steve Demos who I mentioned again in our last episode, but Steve Demas is what I call my prime mentor. Steve is in his mid seventies and he was the, is the creator of uh, what you might've experienced in Silk Soy Milk and the company behind it, which is White Wave. And Steve created that back in the seventies. And one of the things that is very important in center to my life and that I really want to encourage in everybody is mentorship. You know, it's like I am, I turned 36 last week and that's a very, I mean, you're a very relatively young being on the planet. And I think a lot of what has un, sort of what has come undone in society this, in this day and age is that we have, we think that we need to do it all and that we're the ones that are thinking about it and that the history that has come before us is not so important. We have tech and we have AI and we have all this stuff. Uh, and that is a huge disservice to us as growing and developing people. So when I was first exposed to Steve as a potential influence, uh, I realized immediately that I could sit quietly at the feet of my elder 
and borrow 50 years of human experience and what he will describe and i think we'll get a chance to actually meet him in some episodes down the road is he'll describe his scar tissue and so why just base my existence off of my own experience why not listen with respect and understanding to a wise voice who has spent 50 years building and developing and cultivating his relationship to values and his re- expression of how that looks and so in that process Steve, as he, in, in his broken record and never repeating himself type way, uh, educated me on this concept of right livelihood. And right livelihood is uh, part of the noble Buddhist eightfold path. And it is boiled down into a simple concept of what you do in the world and the way that you make your livelihood should be, according to right livelihood, good for me, good for you, and good for everything it touches. And that's the whole basis. And as Ali and I were talking about as we were prepping for this this meeting, or sorry, prepping for this podcast, what is very important when it comes to these huge anchoring core values is that we can't have this long ongoing list of things that I have to think through every time. You know, I have to sit here and be like, oh yeah, what are our values? And I was being very critical around this idea of typically a company will have a wall of values. It's got like eight or 10 things. Like we believe in transparency and communication and, uh, you know, fairness and sustainability. And it's this long ongoing thing. And my critique of it is how do I, as someone who's trying to embody these values, use that in every moment? Because your values are the things that guide everything that you do. And so I have to go, if I have to go through a checklist every time I'm trying to think of, oh, am I aligned with my values? That is a exhausting and not very efficient and a very difficult way to navigate things. So why is why is simplicity when it comes to values very important? And why is right livelihood fall in line with that? Because all that we have to do at real, when we are asking, are we in alignment with our values, is say, are we being authentic? And are we in alignment with right livelihood? And right there, two simple questions. And we can tell immediately are we on track with our mission? Are we in alignment with our values? Is what we're doing in is what we're doing consistent with right livelihood? Is it good for me? Is it good for you? And is it good for everything it touches? And right there, we have the answer to every question that we could want. So when we think about that as part of this company, in part of this podcast, we ask, are is what we're doing in alignment with right livelihood? Does it follow through with that? Am I offering, am I taking care of myself in this? Is, am I getting some return for it? Am I offering you and the audience and everyone who is essentially the you? Are we offering you something of value? And the last step of it is, is what we're doing being good for everything that it touches? And as I've gotten, as I've dove deeper into that question, I've gotten really, uh, nuanced as you do you know first you're just sort of like okay cool i get the idea and then you start to ask questions of like well what about in this situation how do i make sure it's doing good for everything it touches because that gets a bit large and a bit vague and once again steve and his wisdom and his guidance uh, has helped me to remember that in addition to trying to live by our values and live by right livelihood we exist in a reality that is inherently flawed flawed and challenging And so you come up against the reality of a situation. So, for instance, the example that I brought to Steve the other day was, hey, Steve, so, you know, good for everything it touches. If I wanted to do a, say we wanted to create a a reforestation company, very topical here in Costa Rica. We actually work with uh, Costas Verdes, who does reforestation here in the country. And you were trying to make sure that we are taking care of and stewarding the earth. And I said, Steve, so imagine if we had this reforestation company, but I had to install a facility up in the mountains and I had to cut down trees in order to operate and reforest the area. So that seems a little bit in contradiction. I want to be planting trees and I need to cut them down. How do you reconcile that? And Steve was able to give me the guidance of that is just simply the reality. That is the cost of doing these things. So as we're looking at this stuff and as we're trying to think of how can we do good for everything it touches, it's like, well, I had to, for instance, drive here 
And it's like, well, that's a lot of energy, you know, that's inherently unsustainable as we're seeing more and more with global climate change and stuff. Driving a car is, is contributing to uh, a fraction of doing damage to the planet. So can I be in alignment with right livelihood while also doing something that is inherently contradictory to helping the planet? The, the math there that we then do is, is the impact I'm having greater than the cost that I'm taking? You know, so do the ends justify the means in a good way? So you know, these are all things that we're thinking about in alignment with our values inside of real. And so far, I would say, I think it's done a really good job of helping us to focus on these different aspects of what we're going to be offering. And again, we've been keeping it kind of vague. So far, all you've seen is, I think by the time this will be up, we should have the placeholder website, uh, which I'm super excited about. And so by the time you're seeing this, you should be able to look at the website and you'll see. It's, it's a little bit vague. It's a little bit simple. But at the top, you've got our brand, Real. Hope that you like it. We spent a lot of time on the A. Very excited about the A. Uh, and you know, inside of that placeholder website, we have a poem by Nikita Gill. And uh, I don't have it right here in front of me. But I really encourage you to go take a look at it. And it's going to give you a hint at some of the other things that we're bringing out. And part of what we're going to be bringing out with that is uh, what we're calling, uh, or we're borrowing the, the name of Kintsugi. And so we'll actually be applying this in some interesting in new ways to uh, not its traditional form, where Kintsugi is the Jap ancient Japanese art form of taking a broken pot or a broken uh, object and uh, restoring it using gold lacquer. And so Nikita's poem does a really beautiful job of expressing how we are all a work in progress of Kintsugi. You know, it's like, you're looking at me now and it's like, cool, he looks like he's put together, you know, guy who's got his shit together. And in reality, I am the pieced together fragments of a life that has been challenging and difficult and has been rife with struggling with mental health issues and economic issues and all of the things that people deal with, the thousands of challenges that we face in reality. And so that's why we brought in this concept of Kintsugi and we'll be applying it to non-traditional formats where as inside of Nikita's poem, you'll notice it talks about how Kintsugi is the proof that even in the history of an object is valuable. And how much more are you than an object? And so as we get a little bit closer to really uh, launching the fullness of the real brand, you're going to get to see how we've taken this idea of Kintsugi and have applied it to us as people, the work in progress, the patched together fragments of our stories and how the scar tissue and the struggles and the challenges and the things that we've overcome are what part of what make us even more beautiful than before. And so what we want to do with that idea and in conjunction again with authenticity and right livelihood is help us as a society and as a people understand that not only do we want to, not only do we not want to hide the scars and the challenges, we want to hold them up as the very essence of what has allowed us to grow more beautiful and more ourselves. Uh, and this has been a really wonderful exploration uh, in our own process and in conjunction with authenticity. And again, in conjunction with right livelihood. Because yes, we're building a brand. And yes, as you notice on the webpage, there's a merch store. Please, by all means, buy some merch. Tell us what you like. Tell us what you're interested in. Uh, and that is th wonderful for us. We get to you know, receive resources that hopefully you feel great about. You get to receive merch. Fantastic. Uh, and so as we're putting together this brand, which is an inherently commercial thing, we, uh, we provide content, you guys watch, we get sponsorship, great, money flows in. But that only works for us. That will only ever make sense in, the, in alignment with right livelihood if what you're getting out of it means at least as much as the value you've put into it. The hope for us is that we give you much more than we ask. And this is what we do in everything that we do. And hopefully, as you'll see, and hopefully as you pick up from the 
what we're communicating is we don't want to just sell you a t-shirt or a hoodie or a yoga mat. We want to sell you the connection to the values that help you move through the world. And we can only do that by demonstrating it in everything that we do. So it's sort of a roundabout workshopping of how do you create something with right livelihood. And oh, it's raining in San Jose right now, which is awesome. Yeah. This is such a, this, this country is so amazing. It's like, you can sit here, I'll sit here at the window and you'll watch it go from the most beautiful sunny day to this wild tempest of a storm. And that'll happen all in the course of an hour. And then, you know, by the time the sun sets, we'll probably be on a mountain somewhere enjoying the sunset over San Jose. Uh, so super grateful to be able to be forming and building this from, I think, a place that really reflects just how wild and unpredictable life can be in the weather. It was sunny just like a few minutes ago. Uh, and Ali in his you know, brilliance and in his art form was, you know, last time we had, uh, like I think two different lights and a diffuser and all this stuff to make it look good. And this time there's just a window. It's just what's better than, what's better than natural light? Why fight it? If it's already, if it's already done, if it's already done to perfection, why would we, you know, go ahead and add on these other layers? Uh, yes. So, um, real as a project is really exciting for I think all of us because we take this right livelihood value that we're exploring here and I highly encourage you to go beyond just what I can tell you in like a 30 or 40 minute podcast and look it up research it's actually a very small section of the the eightfold path there's not a lot said about it and as you can see, just within these three simple components of it, it does a lot to provide you with a sense of how you can move through the world in a good way. And you'll come up with questions just like I did, like how is right livelihood fit into uh, my business? Or if you don't have a business, how does right livelihood fit into just how I interact with the world? Uh, and our right livelihood in conjun conjunction with authenticity has given this opportunity to do exactly what you're seeing, which is show you a work in progress. This is not a polished thing. We don't know exactly how it's going to come out. We don't know all the different ways in which we're going to uh, express the brand of real and this concept of kintsugi. But in each one of the things, and what I hope that you'll do is you're sitting here looking at it being like, wow, he's talking a lot about values. And like, I wonder if he means it. Keep asking that question. Keep poking us and saying, well, hey, this thing that I saw, how does that, how does that, what I saw you do fit in with your values? And either thunder and either we'll be able to speak to it and talk about how we think it makes sense or we'll go oh that's a really good point we're talking all this big game and here we are making a misstep that we didn't catch and you caught it and together we continue to refine and develop these values in the shape of a brand uh, so Part of what I get to do right now, and it's like I'm, it's my absolute honor and privilege, is I'm working with Steve on a book about the journey that he went on in what he describes as validating for himself the theory that right livelihood is a superior form of capitalism. And so we're working on that book for Steve right now. And that's kind of, that's very, very hush hush. Uh, in regards to Steve, I, you know, I sent Steve the pages that I've worked on. And I said, oh, by the way, we're recording a podcast episode on right livelihood today. Send me your telepathic wisdoms. Uh, because I can sit here and do my very best, but all that I'm really doing in regards to that value is trying my best to express what's been handed to me through his guidance, right? Like I'm doing my best to develop this relationship to, the, to a value, but he's got 50 years of it. And so, you know, the best way to learn about right livelihood is for Steve to be sitting here and we'll have that chance. Steve will, Steve will sit here and talk and um, you know, as much as he's going to you know, act like he doesn't want to, it's, it's his power zone. But he did send me the text message of saying that right livelihood is very simple in filling each individual's responsibility to provide for themselves. Do what you do, what you know, you love that it's good and harms nothing and no one, including yourself. And just like, great. 
And just like start asking that question everywhere you go. And like I, like we pointed out, there's the reality of it. You know, you, maybe you're working at a job and you can't control where all the ingredients come from. And those, some of those ingredients are not acquired responsibly. Well, do you quit the job and go off and do something else? Well, you have to have a livelihood. You know, you have to have a service. Like you can't just like, you know, throw all of the realities and requirements of surviving in this day and age to the wind and be a martyr for this cause. It's a process. So now you know about right livelihood and you're sitting there going, hmm, well, I work at this place and I can see how my own actions are largely in line with right livelihood, but the company that I'm working for isn't. Well, you can't just quit your job today and wander off and have rent to pay, but you can start asking the question of, can I impact this place that I work at in a way that helps bring it closer to a value that you know, perhaps you align with, like right livelihood? Or do I have to now know that my time is limited with this company and that I have to look for one that is in alignment with my values? And that is the meat of this concept of running things based on values, being a values first company or values first person like real is, well, I work at this tech company and you know, let's, let's pick the low hanging fruit and say something like, let's call out Instagram, right? And it's like, cool, you're a programmer that works at Instagram and that's awesome. And you do good work and you're a good person. And you treat everyone with kindness and compassion and you do a good job. Stellar, you are creating a non-right livelihood based product. Instagram is not in alignment with right livelihood. It causes damage constantly. I think that someone told me the other day that uh, largely in response to the way in which Instagram has influenced our culture, that one in, and someone fact check me on this, but I think I've got it, one in three young women that use Instagram have contemplated suicide in almost direct response to the influence of Instagram style culture and how intensely that affects, especially young developing minds. But I think just people in general, I can speak for myself that I don't use social media anymore because it feels like it's sucking my soul out. Uh, and you know, with that in mind, you'll see an Instagram page with me on it and it'll be largely a documentary on me. And so, you know, opportunity to see these sort of other moments how I'm doing stuff, us behind the scenes, that's where you'll find all that stuff. Uh, but I have no interest in being on social media. And so if you are this programmer working at a company like Instagram and you're doing good work, you're a good programmer, you, you want to do good in the world. And Instagram's a giant company. And the reality is, is that you don't have the choice of which direction it goes. Or maybe you do. Hi, CEO of Instagram, please hear these words and realize that your product is hurtful. So that's not right livelihood. It might be good for you, you know, but it's not good for me. And so there are people being damaged by this product. And I can't say about Instagram as far as a, a product is how it, you know, does it, does it do you know, good for me, good for you, good for everything it touches. I know enough about it to know that it's not there. So if you're working at it or you're running it or whatever it is, or you're using it, you get now the option of asking how if I want to stay in alignment with this value, do I move forward? Do I do my best to change the platform? There's a version of Instagram that's in alignment with right livelihood. Do I make the decision that I can't have the impact that I want and I will not permit myself to be in a company that's not in alignment with my values and look for new work? Awesome. You know, like what a brave and incredible thing to do to step out of i mean you know come on tech jobs are great programmer you're making at least you know somewhere i hopefully around close to two hundred thousand dollars a year amazing that's a big thing to walk away from but can you hold to values such as this one and allow yourself to move forward knowing that you are doing good for you but you're falling short of the other things and so can you then live with that reality, knowing that you are out, out of alignment with a, a value like this one. And that's only if this is your value. If this is not your value, okay, you know, congrats, enjoy. You know, I, I'm not judging. These are the values that we, uh, we take on for ourselves. But I would pose the same question. 
of like, what are your values? And is the work that you're doing in alignment with those values? Because it's very easy in this day and age for us to unconsciously just sort of drift along. We, most people, most of us exist in a reality of survival. Uh, and I would hold that in, in contrast to a mindset of thriving. You know, if you're just doing your best to get by and that's a struggle, it's really hard to have some white kid sitting here telling you like, values first, do the thing, da, da, da. And I get that. And that's the reality. And so, you know, there's not a judgment. It's more of just a call to action or more even like a call to inquiry. Just ask those questions. You know, what are my values? Is what I'm doing in alignment with my values? As I said, my core value is integrity. Everything that I do has to fall in line with that. I have to be in integrity with the work that I'm doing, the relationships that I have, the conversations that I'm having. Am I being authentic in, these, in my expression? In real, everything that we do has to fall in line with authenticity and with our livelihood, or we just simply can't go there. So it's a fun thing to think about. Certainly not an easy, you know, certainly not a light topic. So be patient with yourselves as you're asking these questions. Be compassionate to yourself. And I was having a conversation on this very couch uh, with uh, a friend last or two nights ago. And one of the little tools that came up that I really loved is like, ask your seven-year-old self. Dig into yourself and ask for not, not the mind version of you, not this society influenced one with all these ideas and politics and this and that and you know, the influence that we've been provided, ask your seven-year-old self what makes sense and try and very hard and listen to that voice because I found in that conversation we had the other night, it was an incredibly useful exercise to just be like, what does that simpler version of me think? Not this educated intellectual one, not the all of these other influences, just the seven-year-old me. Uh, and speaking of values and such, and actually, I want to do a shout out to Matt Kahn really quick here because I've been loving this wisdom and I'm so excited to share it. This came to me from a Matt, Kahn's, uh, a Matt Kahn lecture called The End of Inner Conflict. And he, in just a, an astounding download of wisdom, pointed out that I'm not on a spiritual journey. My body is. And that's been really important for me learning because I'm this mind creature. It's all mind and talking and that. But even at the core of that, the truth is that if I listen to myself, the thing that I have to listen for is, is my body having fun? Is that seven-year-old boy inside of me having fun? And that's not to say that everything will be fun all the time, but for the most part, my body should be having a good time. That seven-year-old boy in me should be having a good time. And if not, something's probably wrong. So it's a little bit off topic overall, but we're sort of in the realm of values. This is episode two of Real Talk, and this is uh, part two of values. Authenticity, right livelihood, integrity, what is yours? And again, as always, love to hear from you. If you didn't have a chance to comment on the last video and weigh in on what authenticity means for you, please jump in here, jump into the Discord. If you're curious more about right livelihood, ask questions, have a conversation. Our commitment is to help and one to help you with your learning and to discover it with you. We do not have all the answers. I don't have Steve Demas sitting next to me in 50 years of scar tissue to help guide me, of which I'm sure some of your questions will make me go ask him. And if you want any of good, good, good questions, tell us what you want me to ask Steve. And in our conversation with Steve, you get the opportunity to speak to exactly what I'm referring to, a mentor, a guide, an elder with all of this wisdom and maybe you don't have that. And so let's help you find that connection. So we'll go, you know, ask your questions, jump in. Um, by the time you see this, you should check, you should see the, uh, the merch store, the poem, give us feedback on that. Let us know what pieces of merch you're interested in. Give us feedback. It's an exploration. I've never created a, a merch store before. There's some of us around that have, but what do you want to see? What's exciting to you? What's cool? What's sexy? What expresses authenticity? How does it feel like it's alignment? What do you see us missing? Do the whole thing. We're a work in progress. This is Kintsugi. As we pull ourselves together and we fill the cracks with gold, 
It takes all of us together to do that. So thank you so much for tuning in. Really appreciate your time. Uh, we got a couple more episodes already lined up. So right after this, I think we're going to be jumping into a conversation about masculinity. We're going to be talking a little bit more in depth about some of the uh, offerings that you'll see from us in the future. So what you can get excited about. Um, if something inspires you and you're curious if we're going to go that direction, ask us. We'll probably get inspired too and start wandering off there when you can. So you can expect masculinity. We're actually going to dive into some femininity as well because you can't do one without the other. Uh, we've got uh, some conversations started out here in San Jose around things like, uh, oh, I don't know, rock climbing is one of them that we're going to dive into. Culture is another one that we're going to dive into. Uh, we've got some really cool guests lined up to come on and talk about things that are interesting to them. Uh, one of which is a cancer survivor. And I want to speak with them about their journey and what it was like to be in a space of community when you actually face a life-threatening challenge. And all of a sudden you realize that what a lot of people know as community is just a group of people who you hang out at a party with. And when the push comes to shove, where are they? So we're going to be exploring a lot of these conversations. So we hope that you enjoyed the, today's episode and we look forward to hearing back from you. And uh, we'll see you on the other side.